It's nice to be here with you guys this morning. Same. Hi. How's it going? Screw you guys. <laughs> Rakai is not a morning person, if you can't tell. What are you talking about? I'm in a great mood. I just don't like you guys. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> <is> that? <laughs> I don't even know where we should start. I got a list. I got a list right here of little things I just wrote down about where Noah's wrong about things. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think we should start with the one that is probably the most time appropriate. The Pixel. Mm. This is the one I think we probably had the most off camera, off microphone, back and forth. And uh, Noah's all fired up about the Pixel. I am fired up about the Pixel. And, and I think I would have, I think we would have gone deeper last episode. Um, but I, the thing is, I don't like Google. And so I don't closely follow what Google does. And so what that leads to is a... I don't have a ton of confidence about my opinion in Google devices. And then shortly after, I'm, I made a, uh, just, a, just an offhanded comment about it. I, uh, it was my impression that <coughs> Google was – this was going to be a different device and Google was going to yeah. approach this device differently. Then you guys are like, no, it's, it's the same thing as the Nexus. And I'm like, oh, OK. I guess it's the same thing as the Nexus. And then like a couple of days later, my social media just blows up in – hey, this is a totally different device. Google is approaching this differently. I'm like, oh, what they meant to say wasn't that I was wrong. What they meant to say was they just don't believe it. (laughs) There's a difference. Well, so far, it's still exactly like the Nexus. No, no, it's not. Yep. No. The only difference is it has uh, an official Google logo now. Right. And and they're not selling it as an LG Nexus 5 uh, and and it has the and it has the Google Nexus branding. It is an actual Google phone that has been outsourced to another brand to, or to another company because Google doesn't actually manufacture devices. And and the every and every other time I have purchased a device that Google has fully owned and 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 presented as if it is their product that they are making like the Pixel and Google Glass, both of my experiences have been like beyond belief. Like people talk about Apple Care, and I don't think it holds a candle to the service I got with my Pixel. So before we go there, yeah. let's back up and let's talk about the Pixel here for a second. So the Pixel, there's two versions. There's the Pixel and the Pixel XL. There's three colors, very white, very black, and very blue or something to that degree. It's the first phone, as they say, that ships with Google Assistant built in. One of the things it's getting a lot of notes for right now, although we haven't seen real world tests, but it sounds really promising. Is it an incredible camera? Mm-hmm. One that uh, rivals anything that shipped in an iPhone. Um, and then, of course, they're bundling in some of the best Google services for free, unlimited storage for all your photos and videos. Uh, obviously, they're going to bundle in things now like Duo, that they, which is their video calling application. They have a fingerprint reader on the back, no camera bump, USB-C for the charging. And one of the things that I thought was really kind of interesting, and they're including it in every single box, is a switch cord. And the switch cord can go from, say, Lightning or USB Mini to USB-C and then has an application on the Android that will copy the contents of your iPhone over to your Android device, including iMessages and things like that, and get it all set up for you. That's a pretty aggressive move. I think that might be the most aggressive thing that Google is doing here, and they say it's a three-step process to to do this switch. Um, So that's sort of, I think, the the big picture items, and then, oh, I guess maybe also should talk about price. Right now, it's being sold through Verizon, through Best Buy, through the Google Store, or if you want to become a Project Fi subscriber. Uh, which I have tried that service, if, if you guys want to hear my thoughts on it. Um, and it starts at, uh, for the uh, regular size Pixel, I believe it starts at six, 650 bucks mm-hmm. or $27 a month. And that's for uh, their lower 32 gig tier storage. It's another 100 bucks more to go 128, which would kind of be mandatory. So I'll, using the 128 gig is probably the better benchmark to go by. But um, yeah, anyway, so, and then of course the Pixel XL is uh, slightly more, also available for 128 gigs or 32 gigs. With a uh, 5.5 inch display. One thing they've done that I really like is, unlike Apple, since they were actually working on design for this generation, they, instead of having a camera bump on the back, did like a wedge shape. So if the phone, mm-hmm. the Pixel is slightly thicker at the top of the phone than it is at the bottom. It's, nice. it, it tapers. Mm-hmm. And, and so you get this wedge effect that actually looks like it'd be pretty nice when you have it, when you have it on the table and you're using it screen up. Mm-hmm. I think that kind of I think that kind of shape would work really well. Plus, a, that might actually feel and it's it's a real tiny tiny uh, increase in size, so it's almost imperceivable unless you're looking at it right at the edge of it. But so it has a, it has a wedge shape instead of a camera bump, and I think that's kind of one of the more unique things about this phone in terms of design. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's so I, before we get to the service stuff, Noah, because I, I feel mm-hmm. like 
I feel like you could compare it to glass and you could compare it to the uh, Pixel, but those mm-hmm. are not – I don't think those are fair comparisons because those aren't devices you were buying through Be- uh, Verizon or Best Buy. And those aren't um, devices that are – those aren't devices that work at the same scale. You know, a piece of – you know, to get glass, what was it, $1,200? Yeah, they could I, afford to have probably 30 full-time support staff members waiting sure. for I, your – I think that glass is probably maybe a, a slightly unfair comparison, but I think the I Pixel – I, I think the it. Pixel laptop. I think the Pixel laptop is pretty much right on par. The Pixel was probably a at best three million unit market, and a, a cell phone, a successful cell phone, can be tens to hundreds of millions of users. I mean, the scale is it's so different. They're they're not even they're not even in the same universe of products. It's encouraging that at times Google has hired human beings and provided good customer service. I will mm-hmm. grant you that. Um, I have experience with Project Fi. Mm. And that might be the most relatable customer experience to this because you can actually buy this phone on Project Fi. And that has been super easy customer service. A lot of stuff you can do through the app. And also when you do have to talk to them, they're pretty chill about stuff. Like mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I'm just done experimenting with this. Can you suspend my account now for me? And mm-hmm. it was really a simple back and forth. Sure. Uh, so it was – you're right. It was good customer well, I th- service. I think, I think you're wrong. I think you're 100% wrong. I think that um, I think that the Pixel laptop and the Pixel phone are very similar – in, in in terms of they took a market that is dominated by less expensive devices and made a premium device with the backing of Google. And I think they did that in the Pixel laptop case, and I think that's exactly what they're doing in the phone. And I think the only difference is I think the phone is going to be more successful, and thus there's going to be more longevity than there was with the laptop. I think that's the only difference. And then um, possibly we'll see. Um, so And they, they're doing something else. I think this is kind of a good approach. They're offering monthly pricing through their Google Store financing. All right, so let's talk about what I think is the fascinating thing about the Pixel. This is a huge game changer for the Android ecosystem. Mm-hmm. I agree. This is now Google directly competing with the Samsung Galaxy S7 and, and, and the Note, in a sense, and this is a horrible time for Samsung right now. This is Google pivoting to the Apple hardware software release model. This is the same approach that Microsoft is taking with the Surface. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It is first-party hardware, first-party software, which is the original approach of the iPhone. Now this is Google's take on it. You laugh. I'm not laughing. Okay. I agree. I, and in fact, not only do I agree, I think it's a great thing. Uh, I think that I, I think that the advantage that Android has always levied over iPhone is choice. You have one manufacturer and one software stack to choose from. There are no alternative ROMs that I'm aware, that I'm aware of that are in widespread use for iPhones. You use iOS or you don't use iPhone. That's it. Those are your two choices. And I think that Android, the, the reason that it's become so massively successful is because my refrigerator runs a version of Android. You know, there's a, every device you run into. But every this display. fundamentally is going to change this. I agree. I agree because now the, pro- the problem that has been created, the void that has been created in that in in that kind of system is that you don't have any one central thing to start from and say this is what android is supposed to be on this device and we kind of sort of started to get there with nexus but not really exactly because there still were things that google clearly didn't get right on the device that they are supposedly making android for and i and i think this is going to fill that gap and I, so i think the people and you might be included in this i'm not exactly sure but the people that want a to 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 experience android on you know flawless from day one kind of a thing i think there's a i think this will fill that market and then i think for all of the other people that want to sideload roms and use all you know, do all those kinds of things. I think there are going to be a variety of other devices that they're going to be able to do that on. For those of us that were hoping for salvation from Android through a, an open source Linux platform, I think this is a major blow to us. Agreed. Less hardware out on the market, less devices, less people working on this problem is worse for those types of users. Yep. It's probably better for Google. I agree. Um, and I, I also, I don't think the trade off is worth it because I don't. This is where you said we don't believe it. This is where my doubt mm-hmm. and my past experience with Google leads me to believe that they are not a company that is built to pull something like this off. Mm-hmm. What they're offering here is nothing really that unique. They're offering Google Photos and Allo with a Nexus launcher. Mm-hmm. I don't think after – I guess what I'm trying to get to is it doesn't feel like a big enough revolution to fundamentally alter the entire Android ecosystem and – 
what could have massive, massive down channel ramifications. Well, let me ask you, let me pose a question to you differently. If you were hired to Google and they said, we ha- obviously have a, a branding problem here. We obviously have a market problem here. And, uh, and there's a lot of people that are going over to the iPhone. How do we get those customers back onto Android? What would you do? I'll tell you the first thing I would have done differently. The very first thing, I couldn't believe it when they announced that it was a Verizon exclusive phone. Mm-hmm. Un believable unbelievable and here's the best part Mm -hmm. if you are suckered into buying it through verizon which most of verizon's customers likely will be Mm -hmm. they control when you get the updates Mm -hmm. (laughs) they have their verizon crapware Mm -hmm. preloaded on it just like the things we hate about every other android device sure they screwed it up again so you think if they were uh, going to go for a Verizon exclusive, they should have done a, an Apple AT&T iPhone kind of deal where Apple controlled the updates? If uh, Yeah, exactly. If you're going to do it, I guess, fine, put your apps on there if you've got to. But let me update the platform. As a platform creator, I've built this hardware. I've built software for this. I'll, just let me push the updates. You're letting the iPhone do it at massive scale on your network. It's, it hasn't broken your network yet. That reasoning that we have to test every release rationale is bullshit. The, the apps are sandboxed. The APIs are documented. The betas are released months in advance. There's absolutely no reason the carriers couldn't do that and just keep their apps and all of their shitware running on top of a current Android OS. And mm-hmm. if they... And you know what their argument would be? Well, that's very expensive. Well, then don't do it. I, this is why this fires me up, because this fundamentally changes everything for the customer. If Google controls the updates, now the user has the ultimate control, but if Google is allowed, the moment they push out a monthly patch, if they're allowed to send it out to all of their devices, it shifts It shifts the role the carrier has to play to keep those apps running on the platform. It, the, now the carrier's apps are on the same playing field that all the other apps are in the Play Store. And if there's a major, if there's a major platform change, the carrier has to update their apps to support that. Instead of, instead of retarding the platform for years and putting all of its end users at security risk, which to me seems to fundamentally go against one of the reasons you would want to own a Pixel in the first place. Well, actually, it seems from what I was reading that this is some kind of weird half and half model where... The monthly security updates are actually controlled by yeah, Google. Yeah, I did see something like that, yeah. But the, the the OS version updates are controlled by Verizon. And they still ship it branded with their crap apps. Yep. Yeah. But, I mean, that's your choice as a consumer when you go to – when you go through uh, Verizon. Don't buy through Verizon. Go buy this through the is, Play Store. But you asked me – your specific question was what could they do to move iPhone users over? So the biggest – you think the biggest uh, drawback that Android has over iOS right now is the fact that the carrier has bloatware on it and controls updates. No, I think it, it, it fundamentally betrays the fact that Google is not a good steward of their platform. Right, I understand. But what I'm what I'm saying is in, in, in it, it it manifests itself in this particular generation of the phone as this compromise. It it, it manifests itself in compromises that degrade the platform overall yeah. and decisions that degrade the platform overall throughout the lifetime of a product. Gotcha. But when we're talking about uh, changes that could be made for uh, for more adoption of Android over iOS. It, that's your that would be your suggestion though. Would be to is that looking at this just using this particular release as a lens in which to to take this question. I would say that would be a misfire on their part, right there. That would be step one. Yeah. Okay. All right. And it, what? That's and right. I guess what I and, and then and then we get to the other issues I have with it. What's the what is our update cadence on this phone? Is it going to be a yearly phone? Is there going to be a TikTok release cadence? Is there going to be a reason that if I go if I go monthly, is this just monthly financing or is this monthly financing where I can upgrade? I see that I'm also not clear on. And there's a lot of questions where if at this stage, if I'm buying into a premier hardware device like this, I want to know these kinds of things. And with the Nexus, it was a three hundred dollar something test. And, uh, you know, if, if, if it didn't work out, well, you're, you're out $300 instead of $700. Yeah, and if this is a, a real Google phone, how long are we going to get updates for? Two years, I would guess, but I don't know. So you, so in, I, I guess they do explain it down in their financing terms. So basically, you are just financing a, the purchase of a phone. It's that simple. Um, yeah, for 24 months, I see, yep. right? Is that what it yep. says? Yeah. Yep, yep. So, you, so it's so not you, an upgrade program. No, okay. no. It's just, it's, it, you're just, you're paying a monthly fee until you pay off the, until you pay okay. the phone off and then you buy another okay. one. So it's, it's 24 months and assuming we get updates for two years, as soon as you finish paying off your phone, you're going to not get any more updates? 
No, right. well, no, 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 I mean, no, 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 no. Google updates no, for not, a year see, and a half to two years. I guess this is see. I guess this is fundamentally why we disagree. Is because I I don't like to go off of speculation, and that that's there's well, you, there's no uh, there's nothing not you can't so find me anything on Google site that says that in twenty four months they're going to stop doing updates. You're just basing that off of what you think is going to happen based I'm, on some other experiences. I'm basing that off of their past behavior. Okay, but what I'm saying is. But this is the problem is I make the argument that this is a this is a new phone and a new branding <clears throat> and a new marketing scheme. And then your answer to that is, well, that hasn't been that hasn't been the way it is in the past. So obviously well, hold that's on. not going to be you the can't way have your cake and eat it, too, because this is your basic argument for their support. No. Well, my basic argument for their support is that the, this is an entirely new product and you're basing your experience on their support with previous products. They're not relatable to that's this. True. That's exactly yeah, what that's, he's doing no, with the true. support. That's true. That's I'm, true. I'm, I'm thinking it's going to be two years, by the way, because that's what I think the Nexus program was. That's, you're serving my point right now in that there's so many unknown questions and they're selling this at the price of an iPhone or an S7. Yeah. Actually, uh, if you remember uh, back when they had the Galaxy Nexus on Verizon, they only supported that for 18 months. Yeah. I do remember that. And that was a huge deal. Yeah, I got, no, I had a Nexus that only was supported, and it was, I got burned, yeah. yeah. I, um, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. So so last time Google did uh, something with Verizon in a big way, I, I, people you, got screwed. I don't really have an argument against the Verizon thing. I think it was a terrible decision. I, if I was in charge of Google, we wouldn't launch a product with a specific carrier to begin with. We would sell unlocked phones and if Verizon, because here's here's the misconception. There are so many people out there that think there is such a thing as a Verizon CDMA phone and a Sprint CDMA phone. There is zero technical difference between the phones that Samsung sends to Sprint and the phones that Samsung s sells sends to Verizon. They are identical hardware-wise. The only difference is Verizon takes the IMEI off the back of the phone and enters it into a special database that allows it to be activated in their system. That's it. They could activate Sprint phones if they wanted to. They just choose not to. In fact, I've tricked them into activating Sprint phones before. There are guides on how you can trick them into doing it. But so I would not release a phone to a specific carrier. I would just sell it on the Google Play Store. And if Verizon decides they want to activate it, be my guest. If you decide you don't want to activate it, fine. That's exactly what they did, by the way, with the 6P. You and could I activate a 6P on Verizon. I think really they just want to be in the store at the carrier because you just – you generate so many more sales that way. You really do. And I think if you look at this product in a vacuum, it's a pretty solid product, especially mm -hmm. for a Gen 1. Sure. They have a couple of neat things in here that I wish my 6P had. Uh, like if you – they have the fingerprint sensor on the back just like the 6P. But if mm -hmm. you swipe down on the fingerprint reader, it will preview your notifications on the glass screen. So it will show up on the, on the front screen. Which is kind of a neat little, I just want to quickly see what my notifications are. A neat way to wake it up. And the USB-C charger, I'm all about that. Mm -hmm. Seven hours of battery life, it says, in 15 minutes. No physical button, too, which kind of bothered me. The, I would uh, love that. The giant bezels bug me so much, and I don't know why. The, the bezels just look so huge to me. It makes it look like a kid phone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Now, before we get totally done. Uh, you know what I think? One of the things they announced that I thought was pretty cool is their VR headset, that that uh, cloth wrapped VR headset, mm -hmm. where it holds the remote in the visor compartment. That's pretty nice. And I I really think for people who fly or travel, I, for people who are on the go a lot and they want to watch their TV or their movies, mm -hmm. I think VR on a tele on a on a phone is great for that. You Absolutely. get a great three D cinema experience. You get a nice pair of headphones. That people, people, when they talk about VR on these phones, they're always talking about video games. And yeah, that mm -hmm. could be kind of cool, I guess. But I mean, ma imagine, Noah, like if you could have oh, yeah. legitimately like one of the best cinema experiences while you're on an airplane. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and there, there are two problems with uh, when you're flying on an airplane. The first is that you have no room. So setting up a laptop or a, a television or whatever is difficult to begin with. And the second problem is it's obviously very noisy. And so there are two things that are required. Get the screen really close to, in front of your face or off of the, the ledge and stuff like that. And the other thing is, to to drown out sound and, and this solves both those problems and additionally and this is kind of a it's kind of a terrible makes me kind of a terrible person to say this but if you're in an aisle seat then anyone that's been on a flight that's more than six hours knows that like once every three hours that's the average potty break and then your entire row starts tapping you to get out and they won't do that if they can't tell if you're asleep or not so <laughs> if i could just sit there and watch my movie with my headset on and nobody knew my state of consciousness that would actually be really beneficial as well that's hilarious one other big shift before we stop talking about the pixel phone and i know probably people are probably sick of it already but i think there's now two phones on the market there's the iphone and there's the pixel phone 
Wow. For, for, I, I, I mean, I just wow. if you're going to get an Android device, why would you not buy a Pixel at this point? I don't agree with that. I think Samsung is just too popular. Now that we got that out of our system, I just want to thank our supporters at patreon.com slash today, although maybe the URL's changing, so check our show notes if it has. Patreon.com slash today. We're trying to we're doing ten episodes of user air to see if we can raise funds over there to support this show. And we're also posting the background that we use for the video as a thank you and a few other things from time to time. Patreon.com slash today. Keep this show advertising free and leave us a note over there on that wallpaper if you signed up to support user air. Patreon.com slash today. Thanks everybody. So, Noah, you showed off uh, a new piece of hardware on LAS. Yeah, I did. I um, So I have – I started with the – when I started looking into audio interfaces for Linux, I went into a music store and I started playing with them. And the first one that popped, the first one that I just plugged into my laptop and worked right out of the box was the um, PreSonus audio uh, USB box. And – Kind of out of just allegiance to the fact that it worked with Linux, I had been really big on just buying them time after time. I never really looked at other audio interfaces. Um, and a couple of years later, when M Audio became very, very cost effective, um, obviously a lot of people picked those up and, and I used them. And the quality isn't quite up to the same as what the PreSonus was, but it was it was good enough and it was significantly cheaper. And so I, I, I used a couple of those. And recently, in the past couple months, I've been being told by everyone I know that is on Linux and using an audio interface that the Focusrite Scarlet USB is is like the premier uh, audio interface, you know, well, I should say premier on sub $500 audio interface mm-hmm. under Linux. And so I, you know, I was, I was texting with Chris and he says, you know, I, I had a problem with my AirMaster machine. It's not the audio interface is, is kind of going out on it. Yeah, I said, it, has well, a, it has a lexicon on it currently. Yeah, a lexicon alpha. And I said, you know, I, I don't really know a whole lot about this. I, I picked one up, you know, a couple of weeks ago because everyone kept, I, they kept being so positively reviewed. But you might give this a shot because I'm told this is really the audio interface to have. And so and you, you said you bought it 15 seconds after that. Yeah, I did. Well, I, I basically just wanted something that was going to be high quality that worked well with uh, um, not Android, but Linux. And I had pretty good reviews on Amazon, too. And I, I figured that was probably a safe bet all around if Noah says it's going to work. So I was I was pretty happy. And I was like, I was like a giddy little boy. I was like, Rikai, look at my new audio interface. It's going to fix the problems around with the lexicon. <laughs> and Rikai's like, did Noah recommend that to you? <laughs> uh, oh, no. Yes. Yes, Rikai. <laughs> now, why were you grumpy when I told you that, Rikai? Because, Chris, uh, <laughs> about 12 months ago, I was looking at audio interfaces, and... Uh, Uh-oh. So I was looking at uh, the focus rights, and, you know, I talked to Noah, because Noah does a lot of stuff with audio, and uh, Noah was like, well, I've had crappy experiences with focus right. I have. And I've heard, I've heard bad things about them. I have. I have. Yep. Yeah. And, uh... He basically pushed me away from the focus. Oh. Right? The thing I have to do now is I have to go and I have to ask Noah about hardware and then do the exact opposite of what he says. <laughs> because everybody but Noah that I know loves black magic cards in, in their Linux boxes. Everybody I know loves uh, the, the, the focus rights. OK, let me ask you something. Does everybody you know that uses Black Magic in in uh, in Linux are they all running it on 1004? Because if you call Black Magic, they'll tell you that that's the latest supported release for their cards. Now there's hacks to make it work in later releases, but officially from Black Magic, if you go on their support site or you fill out a trouble ticket, they'll tell you 1004. So are all those people using 1004? I don't know. Okay, I haven't asked them. I feel like I can back up my recommendations pretty well, uh, and. And and not only that, like in the case of Black Magic and in the case of 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 this focus right at the time that you and I talked about it, first of all, I had not had the amount of feedback that I have since gotten on on audio interfaces under Linux. That's number one. Number two, I didn't previously own one, and I'm never going to tell you. I'm never going to recommend a product that I haven't at least tried myself. Uh, you know, and and so I can tell. And here's the other thing too: having now tried the Scarlet, I can I can tell you definitively that I don't see any advantage of the Scarlet over the, the PreSonus USB. So had you purchased the PreSonus, I, I don't think you would be losing anything. I it, it just, I simply, there has been so much feedback coming in through the feedback show, uh, feedback form and through other Linux users that I talk to and, you know, over Telegram. And there's so much of it that I can't ignore it. It's, it's, I have to at least acknowledge that there's a lot of people that are using this interface and are very happy with it. I... 
I've been in kind of a funk lately, and I won't talk about it too much on 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 this show. I'll probably talk about it on my YouTube channel. But uh, so I've been having trouble having any motivation to do anything lately, and I was wondering how you guys are able to maintain your motivation constantly, <laughs> because it seems like you guys just mm. never stop, no matter what's going on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there have definitely been times where it's been di- challenging. Um, through big life changes in the last couple of years that have been major, and it's hard to keep going. Um, boy, do you want to take a first crack at it, or do you want me to? Yeah, I think that um, part of it is is that I start to taper or delegate things that I don't want to do in life. I mean, a certain level of maturity just says that you're going to do things that you don't want to do, rather you want to do them, rather you're in the mood to do them. I don't wake up every morning, and I'm ready to go work on networks, right? It, it doesn't happen that way, but... Um, most mornings, it, it, it's a passion. And so I don't feel like I'm at work. I feel like I'm just having fun doing what I want to do. And then it just so happens that people write me a paycheck. Now, there are certain things that I don't like doing and I've never liked doing and I never will like doing, like pulling cable in buildings. And uh, and I mitigate that stuff. I hire other people to do it. I would think about, you know, if you're, you know, what kind of things are you having a hard time getting motivated doing? Are they things that you ordinarily like to do? And so is it is it is it is it one of those things where, I don't want to do anything, not just things I want to do or things I don't want to do. Or is it there are specific things that you don't want to do? No, it's definitely I, I, I just don't feel like doing anything. Anything. So I was working on my garage this uh, the, over the last week and um, and it was just it was I just couldn't motivate myself when I got home from work to go and do more work. And so I found that just going to the hardware store and picking up some of the things that I needed to, to work on it then got me in the mood of, OK, well, now I got this stuff and then I could kind of continue on. So maybe, you know, if you started just by, you know walking around the block or walking down to the gas station, getting a soda or something. And you, you, you put a a tangible goal in front of yourself and say, I'm going to go do X. And then once you do X, I think you might find it's easier to finish the rest of your day. Yeah. So you're building momentum. You're Mm -hmm. starting somewhere Mm -hmm. and getting the ball rolling. That is a, that's an interesting approach. I I think uh, like uh, myself, I have a task I have to do this afternoon, which is one of my least favorite tasks. It's one of my, it's one of the most businessy things that I have to do. And it takes a long time and it's very tedious and so uh, I often probably that's one of the, th- the things I have a hardest time starting simply because there's a million other things I would prefer to be doing. So I do start small there. That's one of the first things I do is I start I start in a in a at the at the smallest simplest spot of the task, and then I sort of I sort of do build up momentum, and then and then it actually uh, when I when I do push through. And get it done. I I'm surprised that I always feel as good as I do about it. Like it does give me a little burst of uh, dopamine or something mm-hmm. that makes me feel good, and then kind of does help build more momentum. Mm-hmm. And also, then you walk away going, "Okay, I, I I do. I've conquered it. I can actually push through and get it done." Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and do you find it easier to do other things after you finish that first thing? Yeah, usually. Or uh, if it's if it's something that's significant enough, it's a big enough chunk of work. I find it okay. Well, I've I've you know. I've earned some time off. I can go get some food or something. Like I, you know, I, 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 that's also a good way for me to let myself off the hook for a bit if I actually get a big chunk of it done. So that's one way, momentum. What you really have to ask is what is the what is the particular problem you're trying to solve? Uh, is it that the task is tedious and you don't enjoy doing it, or is it there's a general depression involved that is preventing overall motivation? So mm-hmm. that would probably be where to start mm-hmm. is to identify something that would sort of feel like it might address that, and that's just a feeling thing. What could I do that would make me feel a little bit better about this or make this seem a little different or change this? Even even if it doesn't improve it, mm. if you change it so you're experiencing something a little different, that sometimes can break you free of it a little bit enough to get rolling again. And, and scientifically speaking, if, if, if it is like if, if it is like you said, like just kind of an overall general depression, then again, walking or, you know, I mean, I don't see Rikai much as a runner, but – Walking in and exercises is, is shown to improve. You know, it releases chemicals in your brain that lift you up and and you know make you happier and, and stuff like that. And I, I guess, uh, I guess I, I I can't honestly say like, yeah, I've done that. I've I've gone for a run or gone for a walk, and I come back, I just feel better. That that's not me, but uh, but scientifically speaking, that's the way it's supposed to work. Mm. Yeah, I, I I'm not I do I do tend to go for daily walks and but I don't come back feeling like all of a sudden I'm exactly. recentered or something. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It does I, feel yeah, it feels nice, but it's it's not necessary. I don't think for like my yeah my mental I don't maybe because maybe I go on frequent walks, maybe I don't really know. But um I I think I also 
I don't even know if it's, I think sometimes just being super sensitive to how things make you feel and then narrowing down for a bit. So like, for example, um, every time I go to Google plus I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed in the service. I'm disappointed in the quality of posts. I'm just, I'm dis I'm disappointed in the engagement. I just find Google plus to be disappointing. Now that's no big revelation. So the other day when I was, I, I, uh, I opened up Google plus and I thought to myself, well, what, what am I feeling when I go to Google plus I'm feeling disappointment. I think I'm going to stop going here for a few days. And I just sort of cut it out for even just really small things, but building them up, adding them up can, can also help. It can sort of be a few less cuts. Sure. Uh, I think it just, just trying to crack through that and giving some sort of change. I know now, since I've done it a few times, that if I do start somewhere small, you know, sometimes you've got to start on a whole episode from scratch. And like, where do you start on something like that? Where do you, where do you begin working on a new episode of the Linux Action Show? Mm. If you think about it, there's a pick segment, a news segment, a main content segment, a feedback segment. There's always something unique that has to be added for each episode in one of those segments. Plus, then you have to go out and figure out what content plugs in there. That's go out, read all of the news, or if you haven't been, or, or go now decide on which news is eligible, and then go figure out the topic that's going to fill this amount of time. And where do you start on that? It is, it is any one segment on that show is a massive task. Yeah. And so it's... It's by necessity, well, I start at the simplest part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I format the doc. Hmm. That's where I start. I format the doc. And then once I formatted the doc, I generally just work on the next part that feels interesting. Like, oh, man, I had a great runs Linux this week. Or, oh, yeah. uh, I've been, been thinking about this news story. And that's where I then I just start That's there. a really good way of looking at it. It gets you into the flow. Another trick I sometimes employ, because, again, the tedious stuff is the part I hate the most, is the night before I create the doc for myself. I, like, I give future Chris a gift. And I usually even kind of forget about it until I'm about to go start. I'm like, yeah. oh, yeah, I already did the doc. The doc's already blank. I just have to. So it, that's sort of like this. So another trick I use is, well, if tomorrow I'm going to do the task and it's kind of the end of the day and I'm not really doing anything else. I'm kind of just sitting here killing time as I wind down. I'll create a, I can, I can, I can, I can zone out and create a blank formatted doc with all mm -hmm. of our, and I just do that. Mm -hmm. And then, and then the day when I sit down to work on it, future Chris receives his gift <laughs> and my, the tedious thing's done and it's kind of like. Boom, and I'm off, and I get going because I sort of have a boost from already completing the part sure. that I kind of dread. Did you know this show has its very own RSS feed? You can find them. Go over to error.show. Click on any of the episodes, and you'll find it right there in the show notes. Subscribe to the MP3 or the MP4 feed. Get every episode when they get released, and from time to time, you'll receive an episode, an edition of the Diamond Collection, our best of our worst that we release just to our RSS feed. I think Noah's going to be skeptical on this, but I've pre-ordered some wireless studio monitor headphones. Um, You're right, wireless. I'm skeptical. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I know this is kind of crazy, and we don't normally talk yes. about headphones on this show, but... Uh, I, I right now, as we do this show, I'm standing. I like to move around so, you know, we can. And, and it's nice to go wireless when you're. Plus, I would like to be able to go to the bathroom and still be able to hear what people are talking about <laughs> during the show. Well, that's disclosure. always important. Uh, and so I would never have done it except for uh, somebody that uh, you're familiar with, Noah. Ronald Jenkins tweeted out about a pair of wireless headphones that he say sound legit, like legit monitors in my ears. These are really good headphones mm -hmm. and they're advanced sound. And I'll have a link in the show notes to his tweet. And they do look particularly good. And they're uh, IEMs? Yeah. They have, they have uh, supposedly studio-matched, like, uh, acoustics. They're set up however, however like, a, like, my, like the, my wired pair right, are right here of in-ear monitors. Supposedly, they're kind of equivalent to these right here. Uh, but they go back to a wireless little, like, uh, transmitter or receiver that goes around your neck. Yeah, what I'm do you think, Noah? Am I crazy? Uh, yes, I think you're nuts. I uh, so there there <laughs> there are a couple of things. One is typically what I found in wireless, with very few exceptions. The Sure ULX comes to to mind as an exception, and um, there's a there's a Sennheiser uh, version that comes to it with as an exception. But uh, with those two exceptions, most times when you take pro audio stuff and try and cram it into a, a wireless space, they don't leave sufficient bandwidth in in the in the radio spectrum to actually 
to actually transmit the, the the audio. And even in the case of the Shure ULX or the Sennheiser, you're cutting down. Um, and so, and, and so I'm just, I'm usually pretty skeptical about wireless anything when it comes to pro audio. Now you can make an exception for that if it's in your monitors, right? Cause it doesn't really have to be amazing. Uh, it, it just yeah, it doesn't have to be amazing. If you, but, but as I've learned at some great cost to myself in the last week, I used to think, well, as long as I can hear the person on the other end, it's good enough. And what I'm finding now is that's not the case. Yeah. And I, I went from using, uh, you know, my, I had these, what are these? Who makes these? The, I, I bought, uh, in-ear monitors that were specific for on video. These are the M6 Pros. Uh, and they're not terribly expensive. They're like 50, 60 bucks or something. And, uh, but you can't see it when they're in my ear. And so I thought, well, these would be good enough. And so that's what I've been using for the last year. And, uh, when we started using user error, I broke out my $500, um, uh, headphones and I started using those and it is, I'm so much more connected to the conversation and it's so much easier to follow along that I thought I, I realized re- rather that audio quality makes a huge difference. And so now I've gone to these, uh, these are the sure, I don't, that doesn't have a model number, but it's the, it's the, it's the ones that you see any, um, any broadcast professional or, or any, anybody that's doing a concert or whatever, if they have in-ear monitors, this is what they're using. Um, and they were significantly more expensive, but I immediately noticed the difference, um, mm. you know, in the clarity and, and that. Yeah. Here's what pushed me over the edge on these ones. They can still be wired. They come, they come with a wire in the box, and you can plug it in. The, the, the wireless mm. receiver has a, has a jack on it, so you can still go wired if you need to. Well, not only that, but if they're being endorsed by Ronald Jenkins, who his, his life is sound, basically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, guy, he probably knows his sound. Yeah. We'll see if there's any interference. I'm more worried about that. You know, I look at them, and I wonder if they'd make good uh, bed headphones. Because mm. sometimes <laughs> I just like listening mm-hmm. to, to stuff to go mm-hmm. to sleep. If stuff's quiet, yeah. I can't sleep. So yeah. I've been looking for I, some headphones. I, I'm with that, you, uh, but I would not. I would strongly recommend against falling asleep with earphones in. Um, what about a Bluetooth speaker? Bluetooth speaker. Anything outside your ears would be fine. Yeah. It just, it That's just, what I use. I use a Bluetooth speaker. Yeah. It's just uh, in uh, right next to you. Oh, let's talk about Bluetooth speakers. So you and I, Chris, are both fans of the um, of the the Bose Bluetooth speaker, right? The best Bluetooth speaker I've ever well, used or heard. In fact, I was at a wedding this weekend, and the entire hall, the wedding hall, was filled with sound by one Bose Bluetooth speaker. Mm-hmm. Like it was like a perfect Bose commercial. It's ridiculous. I'm not even a Bose fan, <laughs> really yeah. necessarily. And, and he, but boy, that was a commercial right there. Well, and so here's the thing: I, I've never. Are, there's a lot of people that will tell you Bose doesn't make a good speaker. Those people are what's known as wrong. Uh, but. Oh I, I don't, however, believe that Bose makes the best speaker, and they definitely sure, yeah, don't make yeah. the best speaker for, for the yeah, cost. Right. And so if you go to – yeah, actually, right in your neck of the woods, um, Sunfire Audio is 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 uh, is based out of Seattle. And, I mean, they make some of the – I have a set of their uh, CRM2 speakers. And, I mean, these speakers are – they're probably $1,800 per speaker. And so you put a, a set of them together, like three, a little over three grand. Um, and you can't even touch the sound of those things. If any, even the Bose's highest quality they won't even touch them, right? But – then there's another market of the best value. What you get is it? Does it? Is it? It, it the what you get for the amount of money you pay. And I think the best value for Bluetooth speakers is the Cambridge uh, ONT Angle Three. Oh, it's really? A, yeah, it's a twenty eight dollar uh, speaker, and I have it sitting next to. I have both. I have the Bose, and I have the Cambridge, and I set them both side by side. The Cambridge has a little bit better bass. Um, the Bose has a little bit better projection, but the thing that really uh, sells it for me about the the about the Cambridge is that it's water resistant. So you can I I would not put my my two hundred dollar Bose Bluetooth speaker three hundred dollars whatever the thing was next to a swimming pool. But I take this thing over to my to my 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 mother's house all the time with the kids in the pool and set it right next to the pool, and there is it's absolutely no problem. So Rakai, if you're looking for a a Good quality Bluetooth speaker for a really great price. The Cambridge Soundworks ONTZ Angle 3 uh, it has mm. a strong recommendation. Which means send, me a, send me a link to that. I'll throw it in the show notes. Sure. Which uh, probably yeah, the, means, Rakai, that you should not buy it. So the Bose, uh, <laughs> the Bose that I like a lot, and I, I uh, sounds like this one for 30 bucks. Is that what you said, Noah? That's an unbelievable deal. Yeah, I, would go that, I would obviously go that direction. The Bose Sound Link uh, that I have is 199 Oh, okay, I bought it. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. bought it on uh, June 29th, two thousand fifteen. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I don't remember. I, the thing is, my my uh, my Soundlink. I actually believe it or not, I got it for free. 
So I, I actually, I didn't pay anything for it, but as so I don't know what they cost, but I've, I've seen them in the store and there is no question. Anyone that tells you that it doesn't sound good or it's a bad speaker is they're, they're full of nonsense. It's a great speaker. It sounds incredible. I think there are speakers that there are some speakers that sound better than it for sure. And I think that there are speakers that are, are more reasonably priced for what you get. I, I think if I, I, if you took nine out of 10 people and put them in a room and set this Cambridge and the bows next to it, I think nine out of 10 people wouldn't notice the difference. I think somebody like Chris or myself probably would notice the difference. Well, I'll give it a shot. Yeah, we'll put a link in the show notes if people are interested in it. This is uh, so this is what uh, I do is I have the bows and it really fills the whole room and it is impressive. And it's then uh, there's apps like mynoise.net and things like that that will generate really nice white noise, easy to fall asleep, non distracting. So this Cambridge one is kind of like a wedge shaped triangle thingy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is really cool looking. Twenty seven ninety nine on the Amazon. Yeah, it, right there. It it is it is. I think it is the best speaker for the money. I don't think you. I think I think uh, value wise, I don't think you get any better. Now, for those of you out there that might have a partner that wouldn't want sound, like that used to be my scenario. Is I was the only one that wanted like an audio book or something to fall asleep to. I've talked about these a long time in the past, but man, I really love pillow speakers. Yeah. Uh, and there's a, there's a couple of different ones you can get. Uh, I don't like the disc shaped ones, which is like the ones that come up the most when you search on Amazon. I like the uh, flat cloth ones because they just go under, they uh, they just go under the pillow. So you got to be careful because sometimes they're a little uncomfortable. But under pillow speakers are such a great way to listen to a podcast or an audiobook without disturbing a partner when you're going to bed. So I prefer the Bluetooth speaker because then the whole room is filled and. Um, I, I don't, I never worry about knocking the pillow off or the speaker under my pillow out. I just, it's just simple, but these are very nice as well. If you, uh, can't fill the whole room with noise. Well, see, I, uh, I'm, I'm the type of, the type of person that's considerate of others, Chris. And, uh, sometimes people spend the night at the studio <laughs> and I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to <laughs> fill rooms with audio, Chris. <laughs> Blast it out. Well, you know what you do is uh, you just leave, uh, Whatever program I had where it would jack, the one program had notifications jacked all the way F up, and so it was blaring loud. And that's all. That's all you do, Rico. They just fall asleep to notifications on your uh, PC uh, blaring off constantly. <laughs> well, trust me, Chris. I know about your notifications <laughs> blaring in the, at odd hours. <laughs> that's what I was referring to. <laughs> I don't know why. It's, it's okay. It's okay, Rico. We both, we both have our nighttime transgressions. We yeah, but here's do. but here's the thing though. You don't. First of all, if you're there, I'm sure they bothered you as much as it bothered him. So you just shut no, it I off. No, I wasn't there that night. I wasn't but there. But you that never night. lock your office, so it's not yeah, like that's true. That's you true. Know, just go turn it down. Yeah, and there is a. Yeah. I ain't gonna go in Chris's office and mess with his personal computer. There is you a never, volume knob on there. You you, could... you, you, Chris, have you seen your desk? Yeah, I know it's it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's awful. What? It's what's awful. What's wrong with this? What's wrong with your desk? Rikai is too busy leaving the oven on. Again, all night long. Jesus. If there's no, if there's not a user error one week, it's simply because Wait. the studio burned to the ground. <laughs> Did I do that again? Yes, you've done it a couple of times. I just usually you're asleep, so I'm not going to wake you up. Like, Rika, you left the oven on. <laughs> Wait, did I do that again last night though? No, no, like two nights ago or three nights ago. It was a little. It was a little while ago. It was <laughs> since last user error, but before this weekend. So that's your range. <laughs> And you know how my tell is? Is first of all, when the oven goes all night, it is like a heater. So the downstairs, <laughs> it's like a, it's like you're coming home to to mom's cooking. Only mom's cooking pizza happens in a place that you have to sit for an hour. Well, do a thing that's already going to generate a lot of heat. Clearly, that means I'm not getting enough sleep because the only time that ever happens is when I'm super super you pass tired. Out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, you, know, you know what? I mean, on the upside, I've never left the stove on with food in it. Yeah, that's true. Or like a stove, the stove top that's, or something. Dude, that's worse. How you so you take the food out, but you don't yes, turn the yes. oven on. I don't. That, yes. that does that makes less sense to me. If you left the food in there, at least I'd be like, oh, I put the food well, in there and forget. Because about sometimes, it. Noah, you you, you got to take the food out to see if it's done cooking. Yeah, yeah. And then by the time you're 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 done checking the food, so you hungry, forget that Noah. you left the, the oven on <laughs> because you're tired as hell because you have a normal sleep schedule and you don't sleep three hours a night like oh. Noah. <laughs> He's got to eat. So, but, but oh. so I walk in, I walk in and it's a wall of heat, but it's like this warm pizza smelling wall of heat. And that's always my mm -hmm. tell. Either Rikai I, woke up really early and had a pizza for breakfast, which is totally possible, or the oven was going. And that's always sort of the tell. So you can I, tell the oven was going because all of the all of the cupboards and equipment around the oven are really warm too. So, <laughs> so I, I had so so when we moved into our house back in November, uh, it did not have a working. It still does not have a working oven. We just don't have a working oven. And uh, it's on my list of things to do. Do you have but a stovetop? I have a stovetop. Yeah. But it, I'm one of those people that I either do something right or I'm just not going to do it. And so 
I start researching ovens and I'm like, well, what oven would I want? Well, it turns out the oven that I'm going to buy, if I'm going to spend my hard earned money on an oven, is going to be a really good oven. It's like 2,500 bucks and it's a, it's a dual oven. But in order to get the dual oven to fit in there, I have to have the cabinet modified and we're not keeping the cabinets anyway. So I, what I'm end up, end, going to end up having to do is order custom new cabinets for the kitchen. That's the big cost. So it's just not oh, man. enough. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so that was November. About three weeks ago, uh, we get my wife a new vehicle. And, oh, congratulations. Yeah, and, and I have a, a, a buddy of mine. He's a, he's a mechanic. And so the first thing I do is I have him look everything over before I, I ever buy something. And then I and then it, we, him and I, we he t- I take it out to his place. And then he goes over and, and, you know, checks a couple things and tweaks a couple things and fixes the odds and ends that when you're buying a used car. So, so I'm over at his place. And, uh, and, and I, you know, me, I, I've always got to ask questions. I can't just let the poor man work. So he's got it up on his lift. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's really cool. What? Do you ever worry about that thing falling? No. Well, what happens if it did fall? It would crush me. Huh. Well, how, what happens if like the hydraulic loses pressure? Then it goes into the locks. Huh, how's that work? <sighs> like this. And then he pulls this lever and the thing goes ksh, ksh, and like drops down like six inches, but locks. And so I'm just, I'm asking him all these questions. He's getting more, you know, infuriated with me, but his wife is in the kitchen and she's making frozen pizza for my kids. So I, I go in the kitchen. I'm like, ah, gosh, that smells good. So we sit down and my kids are eating pizza and my, my, my kids are ratting me out. They're like, yeah, we don't get to eat pizza anymore in our house. Cause we don't have an oven cause daddy hasn't fixed it. And, and so, uh, so I'm sitting there and, and you know, my wife and I are eating pizza. And so we get home that night and Sarah looks at me and she's like, God, I wish, wish we could have pizza. Pizza's so good. I'm like, yeah, I, I do too, actually. I, I really kind of want pizza. And she's like, <laughs> what What are the chances you could fix that oven? And I'm like, zero. I don't know anything about ovens. And she's like, well, could you try? And I'm like, eh, I'll probably electrocute myself. And she's like, eh, probably don't do that then. So we start thinking, well, how, what are we going to do about this? So I'm like, don't they make like just pizza ovens? She's like, yeah, I think they do. So I go on Amazon and I look. And the Presto pizza oven, it, it looks like a little triangle. It's not even look like an oven. It just looks like a little triangle. And then you set the pizza and the pizza rotates around inside of the triangle and somehow cooks it. And I'm like, man, that's really cool. I'm like, the problem is even on Amazon Prime, it's not going to be here until tomorrow. I want pizza like now. She's like, yeah, I agree. So we go to Walmart and uh, sure enough, they have one left. They have this, this Presto pizza oven for, is on sale actually for 45 bucks. And I bought that thing. Chris and Rick, I, I'm telling you. We went through like five pizzas that first night. I mean, we went through like a pizza per person in our household. And then every night after that, we've eaten like three or four pizzas. It looks like amazing. it's it's like an, was it an infrared uh, bur- uh, no, cooker? No, it's not infrared. There's an actual, there's two heating elements and they, they just, it just heats up like crazy. So it's super inefficient. But And, and then it's I, on like a rotating Lazy yeah, Susan. Yeah, but the Lazy Susan comes out off of the little thing. So when it's just sitting on your counter, you don't have this big like round. Is it cast iron? No, it's plastic. Oh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, tray, tray is steel. Yeah. So it looks like it does wings and all kinds of stuff too. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I can't make this up, Chris. Uh, you want to know what I told Noah about, about six months ago? Are you serious? Yes. No, yeah. did you really? <laughs> yes. What, why did you tell me? Well, like, did I say, was I complaining about not having an oven? No, because I was thinking about getting one. Oh yeah. Yeah. Did Sounds you get like one? it passes the sniff test. No, right I, I didn't get one. It's but su- dude, it's super amazing. It's so amazing. It's <laughs> a, in fact, it, this is kind of gross. I probably shouldn't say this. In fact, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this for my wife, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, we, we are eating so much pizza now over the past couple of days that we have stopped like washing the pizza cutter thing and the little tray thing. Like it just, it, the, it, the tray barely cools down and it's because we, we have we go like two or three of them for lunch and then two, this three is of them adorable. For yeah. I just, I'm really into to, to pizza right I'm now. I'm not, I'm not recommending you should do this Rikai, but the real crazy thing about this is you could clear off some death space and you could actually <laughs> oh, you could cook that sucker upstairs. It's bad enough he leaves the oven. Well, this has a timer, so you can't leave this my, and then, and then you don't got to go downstairs to retrieve the pizza. <laughs> I'll, t- I'll tell you the only thing that I think is really stupid about this pizza oven thing. You have to unplug it to shut it off. Like there's no oh. power switch. Yeah. Oh. So the heating Ugh. element will shut off when the timing, when the timer goes off, but it still continues to rotate around. And I'm like, it's, just, it's really, it's a really kind of dumb design, but huh. I have eaten more pizza in the last week. That, and then, and it's funny too, because like the other night I'm talking to Rakai and I got done with show notes and I, you know what I'm thinking, right? I'm thinking I'm going to roar myself with a frozen pizza. Cause that's, you know, that's my thing lately. So I get done with the show notes. I'm like, yes, time for frozen pizza. So I get up and Rakai's like, trigger word. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, you triggered me. I'm like, how did I trigger you? And he's like, well, I, I want pizza. I'm like, yeah. So, yeah. so I, so I open up the cash app, which by the way, Chris, you should be installing right now. I'm like, this here, guy. guy, have some pizza for, have some pizza. So I, I give him a couple bucks for pizza. And then he's like, well, I had it on automatic cash out. So I won't get the money for three to five business days. 
<laughs> Even though I gave Jeez. him an extra dollar to cover the instant tra- the instant deposit thing. So Cash just uses PayPal? No. Cash is like way better than PayPal. Cash, what Cash does is well, Rakai will disagree. We should probably not talk about it. We'll talk about well, it. So, so ca- before we wait, before we get off this thing, by the way, it also looks like people use it to cook marshmallows. They put marshmallows in their thing. They wings. Yeah, I would not recommend marshmallows because the tray is it's not flat. It's got little bumps. I so can't what imagine. they did is they put a uh, they put like a, like a pizza stone or something like that in the tray. So they put the marshmallows oh. on top. You could probably just put foil down though, or wax yeah. paper. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. That would work. In fact, I probably put foil down every time just so I didn't have to. I'm lazy like that. So that way I don't have to clean them. My trick is I put foil down and I just toss the foil. You know, Chris, uh, before we move on again, I'm going to have to call you out, Chris, because uh, I feel like part of the problem here is that this studio has so much technology in it, but our kitchen is from like the 1980s. Well, we don't do any cooking shows. We got to do a cooking show and then we'd probably upgrade in there. Yeah. <laughs> what's wrong? I don't know. What's wrong with the kitchen? I've never no, had the oven's the only the oven's only like six years, seven years old. The oven's well, actually I've, pretty new. And the, the only thing I've ever had, the only thing old. I've ever like questioned in the studio is the dishwasher. Everything the dishwasher's is old. Yeah, the yeah. dishwasher's the dishwasher needs to be taken out back. Well, okay, so it might not be that old, Chris, but it's not a, a very technologically advanced uh, oven. Right. There's no LCD. Well, there is a little. Well, hold on, hold on, stop. What? Whoa, technology. It's an oven. It turns on and it heats up. What more do you well, want? Well, this thing, this thing. It 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 doesn't even have, like, there's ovens that you can get now that have automatic shutoffs. Well, it has Jeez. auto cook mode, but you have to, so you, if you turn on auto cook mode and then you tell it how long to run, it will turn off, but that's a different mode than bake mode. I was thinking that too, like, why not have just like a, after seven, eight hours, it beeps a couple times and then turns oh, off. Oh, no, that wouldn't work for me. I cook for more than seven, eight hours sometimes. And maybe that's why. Then, well, no, yeah. no, but the, the ovens that they have these days, you you they, you you have a default automatic shutoff, but yeah. if you're going to cook longer, you can just disable it. Here's what I do is when I'm making like, so I cook bacon in that oven for 23 minutes from mm-hmm. cold. Mm-hmm. I put I put it on a put it on a tray, put it in the oven, bake it for 23 minutes at 400 degrees. Mm-hmm. And I use auto cook for that because usually I'm in the studio when it's done. And so what I'll sometimes do is I set auto cook, auto cook for 20 minutes and then I kind of have like a five-minute buffer while the existing residual heat sort of lowers down. But I, I do use autocook for that particular function. The other time I use autocook in that thing is uh, when I was, I was cooking a, a rack of ribs in the oven and I had to leave the studio. And I cooked I – I had it on autocook and then I didn't get – I didn't make it back for like six hours. Best ribs I ever had. Yeah. So I, yeah. it was like – because the ribs themselves cooked – I was planning to cook them for like four hours. Yep. <laughs> Okay, I will say as as a final defense to me, it's not much of a defense, <laughs> but it's a defense. If it was this past week, I've only had pizza in the morning, so it was only on like a couple hours at most. It would have been early pizza because I got in. I think that was the morning I got in like at seven or something. Yeah, I think that's a breakfast pizza, Rika. You are a pizza yeah, baller. yeah. Because because if you recall, I remember you telling you that I heard you coming in that morning because I was up several hours earlier. Uh, that was a different day, I think. Was it? I think so. But no, I you only came in at seven I, one I, day. Chris. I can't. Keep, I keep. Can't, I can't keep track of all this. I can't keep track. Well, of all I this. can't apparently keep track of the the, the oven. So I really <laughs> like this rotating oven. If I ate more pizza, I would get this. Also, I didn't. You know what? That's what I used to say, and then I realized the answer is not if I ate more pizza, I would get this. It's if I get this, I would eat more pizza. 